What's up brainy babes? Welcome back to another video. I apologize. I've been You should see my setup right now because I'm trying to fix my lighting in here It's really cloudy out right now. It's a rainy day. So welcome back to another brain talks with B We are gonna be talking about stress We're gonna be talking about burnout today and just dealing with it all how it looks in the body and in the brain and that kind of stuff So we're gonna pick it apart I'm going to try and make it as simple and as easy to understand as possible and it's hopefully not gonna be as long as my last videos I know I I kind of spiel off a little bit so even though I feel that I have a really good understanding of stress I still want to have a little disclaimer saying I'm not a professional in any way I am just a student getting my bachelor's currently interested in research in psychology um, this is just based off of like what I've learned in school already and what I've kind of learned and like my perception of things and also some of my tips and tricks for you guys on dealing with stress because as a student like I've had to learn to regulate my stress and regulate my emotions and also I've had to to learn to cope with just a lot of a lot of stuff on my plate at one time so I promise you guys there's a lot of great stuff in this video let's get into episode 2 of brain talks with B on stress and burnout So sometimes the first step that we forget to do in dealing with stress is actually realizing that we're in stress and actually realizing that we're in burnout. Although I want you to understand like I know that there can still be other causes. You guys, I am dealing with lots of health issues right now so I promise you I understand how it feels to be like unheard even if you have something going on other than stress. But in that in itself, I also know that my stress makes my health issues ultimately worse. There is a lot of research that has shown associations between these um, symptoms and stress. So I'm going to read it off. I have a list written down. Um, tired, not sleeping, headaches, issues concentrating, anxiety, hopelessness, loss of appetite, reduced performance, pessimism, GI issues, anger, muscle pain. Um, and then I also, I kind of like narrowed it down to ones that I feel are really specific that I noticed to like jobs in college. Um, so for me personally, and what I've also noticed in just in my experience of like looking at other people in your job it typically is feeling detached feeling like you're not doing as good of a job as you typically would feeling like your performance is maybe less as it typically would be um feeling overwhelmed exhausted and just that kind of thing and then in college um it might more look like it might look more like frequent illnesses, concentration issues, appetite issues. It is so common that you see a pattern of like students getting sick after exams and being sick over like their break periods and stuff. I have not done research specifically on that for this video, but that is something really interesting to look into. It's definitely a pattern you see, especially in colleges. Noticing the signs and the symptoms to show you it. So like me currently, Aside from dealing with my health issues, I'm noticing that I have been burnt out because I am not sleeping as good. I am like, I'm very, very anxious. And when I get overwhelmed and when I get like burnt out and too stressed out, I genuinely, I can't focus. I can't concentrate on anything. I'm so irritable. I just like, I just get so like, I get the feeling like you're so stressed, you feel like your skin's crawling and you just feel like defeated. And so if that is you, if you're noticing those signs, I just want you to stop and realize that you need to take a breath and something is going on and just realize that you are overwhelmed, you're in burnout and something needs to happen. You need to take a break. So I was also curious about the statistics of stress and the differences on COVID and just what's happened. So the APA actually sends out like a stress in America's report and so they found that um, Ages 35 through 44 reported the most significant increase in chronic health conditions since pandemic. It was actually 58% versus a prior 48%. Um, the ages 35 through 44 also experienced the highest increase in mental health diagnosis, a 45% versus 31% in 2019. Um, ages 18 through 34 were at the 
still at the highest rate of mental diagnosis at 50 percent we're going to talk about first like what stress does to the body and the brain and then we're going to talk about like addressing stress and i'm going to go through multiple different like situations and just different different situations for different people out there and trying to help you in the best way possible all right, so we always start with my favorite, the Google definition. So stress can be defined as a state of worry or mental tension caused by a difficult st situation. It is a natural response that prompts us to address challenges and threats in our lives. Everyone experiences stress to some kind of degree. So this is something that is universal. So I do wanna cover that stress can be good. Sometimes we forget that stress can actually be good. Like it's natural, it helps us to deal with those challenges. So like obviously the common, um, the common situation offered as an example is, you know, being chased by a bear, but it can happen in your daily lives, like how you deal with daily survival situations, like, you know, in a in a car, in a car, like you get stressed in like a tense area, but you're, you know, you're more focused, like you're kind of, you're, you're honed in on what's going on because you're kind of stressed about it and you're just, you're tenser and you're focusing on not crashing your car because there's a bunch of idiots around you, so like your stress kind kind of helps you and challenges you and motivates you to like watch out for other people in that moment. If you come across a bear in the woods like you're gonna get stressed, you're gonna have the flight or fight or flight response happen and you're gonna be like, mm, I gots to go. So the reason your body does this is because essentially you have the nervous systems. So the nervous systems are very complex and I'm gonna try and make it as simplistic as possible, but I love the nervous system. So I'm really gonna try not to go off on a, <laughs> on a spiel here, but so essentially there's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system is basically everywhere else. So the central nervous system is basically like a post office. It's kind of like the receiver and the processor of information and it, it responds to sensory information that's sent from the brain and up through the spinal cord. So your your spinal column is really like your your area of communication. That's where like your, and like your sensations get talk to and like talk to the brain. I'm really trying to make this not complicated. So essentially like there's a there is a neuron a neuron is a cell that is in the brain. It's the um, soma it has the axon hillock and the axon and the dendrites. The dendrites basically like connect to other neuron dendrites and they like talk to each other. And there's action potentials sent through the myelin sheath, which these the myelin sheath like protects it and basically it makes it so it can go like super fast, right? Um, why can't I think of the speed right now? It's like two something seconds, milliseconds. There's a whole unbelievably detailed communication system going on in your nervous system. So then there's the peripheral nervous system. So we talked about the central nervous system, which is basically like the processor, the communicator, the receiver, that kind of thing. So now we're gonna pivot to the peripheral nervous system, which the peripheral nervous system is basically split and divided into two different systems or parts. All right, so there is the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So the somatic nervous system, this is your voluntary nervous system. So like this is, how you like clicked on this video or how you opened up your computer like you're doing these things intentionally you're doing them voluntarily and like you kind of are conscious of doing them you're controlling them the autonomic nervous system basically is the control place for all of these flight or flight responses it's the control place it's basically the system that understands when you touch the oven immediately you want to move your hand away from the oven because it's like ow what is going on you do that unconsciously because your autonomic nervous system basically tries to protect you from these stressors in your life and tries to figure out okay do I fight or do I flight you know that's basically what it is and then these two can be divided again into the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system which the sympathetic nervous system essentially like increases energy increases heart rate increases blood pressure it uh, also allows your sweat glands to sweat and like secrete that and so like this is what happens when you know you're exercising or when you have to run from the bear like it's increasing your heart rate and stuff and it's it's controlling that it's balancing like your 
your homeostasis in your body to match the environment in which you are in. The parasympathetic system essentially does the opposite. This is a system that conserves your energy and it also um, increases digestion. So this is like when you, you're more relaxed and you're eating a meal, this is like increasing your digestion because you're not dealing with other things like it's matching the environment basically. This is the increase in salivation. <laughs> and it lowers your heart rate. So the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system work together But sometimes when you are overly stressed and when your environment is basically sending signals to your brain saying That you need to respond to situations as if you were in a flight or fight or flight situation on a daily basis that's when things start to get more complicated. This is the brain and body effects of stress. So stress starts in the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And this is where your adrenal gland releases cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So there is the adrenal gland, which is located right above the kidneys. And then there's the pituitary gland, which is my favorite. It looks like a little ball sack and it's in your brain. So the pituitary gland is essentially supposed to um, balance stress and kind of like control stress the adrenal gland is the hormone that is called cortisol and the pituitary gland is supposed to regulate cortisol production so too much cortisol and the pituitary gland gets overwhelmed and it can't deal with it thing that is seen with cortisol levels being increased or just stress increase in general is an increased appetite because when you're stressed you know you want to reach for those quick junky foods and comfort foods and such so that is seen that like you know an increase of that can obviously cause so many issues in heart health and like with certain fats like visceral fats and consuming too much cholesterol plaque builds up in the arteries and just there's so much associated with that so you guys it is like it's a serious thing that you need to watch what you are putting in your body and how you're taking care of your body epinephrine causes your heart to beat faster and for your your blood pressure to be raised so that's where if you're stressed you'll experience a higher blood pressure so there's also the enteric system which this deals with the gut and the gi gastrointestinal tract so the autonomic nervous system and brain communicates stress to the enteric system and this can disrupt gut bacteria and digestion because essentially your brain decides well i'm too stressed out right now to deal with that right now like i'm pushing that to the side it's like and i do this all the time when i'm overly stressed i highly highly prioritize my stress over like myself but everybody does it sometimes we all sometimes prioritize our stress over ourselves we are almost done going over everything that the stress can do to the body but i just want to cover a couple few other um notes because of all of those symptoms I mentioned in the beginning I kind of want to explain how they can work in the body and how that can happen essentially because you might see all of those symptoms and you know you might be like me where you just kind of brush it off and be like oh whatever like you know those can't really be associated with stress can they and like they can I know they can I definitely procrastinate that sometimes <laughs> like my brain procrastinates eating sometimes stress hormones are shown to be affecting immune cells and can actually dampen their functions and it's associated with telomeres being shortened which is basically like um it's the tip of the chromosome that tells the cells age so like if it's shortened and shortened eventually it's not long enough for the cell to divide and essentially the cell dies off and when your cells are dying off and when it gets to a point that they can't can't keep dividing and reproducing that causes issues as i said it starts in the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis it's activated and releases cortisol this basically increases activity level and the number of neural connection um, in the amygdala which is the fear center so learning and memory deteriorates um, electrical signals in the hippocampus deteriorate and it inhibits an ability to control stress so you literally as you get too stressed you inhibit your ability to deal with stress like you are genuinely changing your brain chemistry this can be reversed beautiful thing about the brain is, is how it's so malleable and flexible and there are things that are irreversible but there are multiple things that are reversible and the beautiful thing about stress is 
this can be a reversed it can be controlled you can balance your cortisol level so now we are going to get into regulating all of this and how do you deal with burnout because now that we might figure out sorry there's a hair on my lip that keeps popping up <laughs> but so now that we kind of understand Oh my gosh! I would like to look at some ways to regulate your stress and to regulate just feeling burnt out and feeling unsure, feeling lonely, feeling hopeless, just feeling like you just can't anymore. There was so many searches for burnout at work and dealing with burnout without a break and like that was the main theme is like how to deal with burnout without being able to rest and I feel like this is the this is the big issue is like nobody feels like they have the time to rest and you know what I totally get that feeling but the thing that I've had to learn is that I need to implement time for myself and I really need to set aside time to allow myself to deal with stress because you have to like genuinely you have to sometimes we need to fit our schedules into time because like look like we have to take a break, but time doesn't take a break. As, as I've said in my videos before, we rest, but time doesn't. I, I'm going to go through some steps to deal with it, but I, I really want you to realize, like, the whole focus of this is, like, your brain and your body responds to the environment you're in. So whatever environment you're in and whatever environment you put yourself in, your brain is going to respond to appropriately how it sees fit to do so. So if you're putting yourself in overly stressful situations and you're not putting yourself in restful situations, your brain is only going to know to deal with those stressful situations and it's not going to know when to be able to relax and so that's why we need to introduce times to rest and introduce times to feel the rest and to just be ourselves and to just not be working and not be on social media and not be doing anything not trying to fill our brains with a bunch of stuff like just to just be and be mindful that will it, it will help you it will help your pituitary gland to be like, okay, I know what I'm doing. Like, I ain't got cold balls anymore. They ain't blue. Like, like, I don't know. That was a horrible joke. That was a really, really bad. So we kind of other already covered step one. Step one is to address and realize that you are in burnout or you are stressed. So identifying that you are in burn burnout is looking at those symptoms and realizing, am I really stressed? Am I anxious because I'm just anxious right now? Am I anxious because I am overwhelmed and getting burnt out? Like, because there's, there's moments where, you know, I get anxious, I get stressed out in the moment, and it can be good for, like, when you have a test coming up, that's actually pretty good stress because it's supposed to motivate you to try harder. If you're stressed about your test, it shows that you care about it. So that's good stress but then there's also stress where it's like you're cramming your brain for the test you're overwhelmed you're exhausted you're highly caffeinated you're smoking nicotine for lunch and breakfast and that's when i think you might need to double check if you're burnt out or if you're just stressed because when you have all of those symptoms in one that is when you can realize that i'm not just stressed i'm burnt out and i'm getting towards burnt out so this is when you might have high cortisol levels. This is might might be when you have higher blood pressure. This might be when you feel tachycardia. Like this might be like genuinely like so many people have panic attacks and think they're having heart attacks. And like this is this is real. Like that's a real feeling. Like that's what it feels like when you have a panic attack. Trust me, I know. Just calming down and realizing when you're in that situation to bring us to step 2 identify your main stressors so i would like you to think of three or four in this moment if you have more try not to think of more than 10 because i know like sometimes it's not great to do this when you're super super overwhelmed because if you have so many so many stressors on your plate and you're just focusing on like listing off 20 stressors like then you're gonna start focusing on the negative of those stressors and you're gonna start getting like angry about those things too. So try and just think of like three to five stressors to focus on right now. What are the main ones in your moment of time right now? What is causing you the most stress? So for me right now, I'm gonna say my health. My health issues are a really big stressor for me right now. 
school midterms is a really big stressor for me right now money is a really big stressor for me right now um just keeping up with everything keeping organized with everything and that's kind of like me right there i'm realizing i'm kind of burnt out like i have a lot of stressors i'm listing off and they're kind of broad um so that's kind of my telltale sign that i need to take a break one thing you can do is identify your stressors and either try and flip them positively and look at them in a better light now i know this is really hard and i know like if you have something like a grief you're going through and if you have some kind of loss you're dealing with or if you're dealing with something um, like domestic violence and that kind of stuff. Um, for one, I would like you to wait until the end of the video and just check out my description and the links I'm going to talk about because I've come up with a lot of resources I'm going to go over and I think they might be of help to you. But um, identify your three stressors. Either try and flip your mindset on them and just try and look at them in a positive light. Try and be thankful for them in some way or try and just put them above that line of stress like just try and realize what is good about this what what can this do for me and then just determine what is out of your control and what is in your control so when you do this like when you're trying to flip the mindset that's kind of when like if you don't want to do that that kind of tells me that you're not really in control and a lot of my stressors i'm not in control of like i'm not in control of the fact that i have to pay an arm and a leg to this stupid college company that just takes my money and i don't feel like it's going anywhere good other than my education and like i i get it um <laughs> it's really hard to do that and it's out of my control that I have to pay so much for groceries. It's out of my control that taxes are so high right now. So out of your stressors, just split it up. Maybe just do a little graph of like what is in your control and what is out of your control. Now this would really work if you do have a lot of stressors. If you're stretching to 10 or more, I would like you to do this. I feel like this would really help you just do in control versus out of control. And after you do this then i would like you to look at the things that are out of your control those would be things that would be really good to try and do that mind flip on and just see how can this be a learning lesson for me how can this help me to teach others how can this help me in any way how can i make this positive how can i see light in this situation I know that that might not be super possible for everything i know some things are really really hard to flip and put into a higher light but I would just like you to like try. And other than that though, look at the things that are in your control. These are things that you can work to change. These are things that you can control. So me being stressed out about school right now, me being stressed out about midterms and being burnt out by everything and being burnt out by so much stuff on my plate, I can control that by trying to manage my schoolwork more and trying to plan better around my, my schedule of school and homework. For some of us, it's just setting aside that moment. It's just setting aside that time to relax, to just be by ourselves, to not be sitting on social media because guess what? Relaxing is not sitting on social media. That is not relaxation because you can be scrolling for one minute and in that one minute of time, you can either cry, you can laugh at something, you can feel disgusted by something, you can feel offended by something. Like literally in just one minute, you can go through like six different emotions on TikTok and that is so not good for us. Like that is so not good for us. And I know it's just the quick dopamine. Like you just want that quick dopamine. I can just scroll on here and it'll make me feel better. I'll be inspired. It might give me a a good idea i get it i get all the excuses but it's not good for us like we all need to go through a little fast of social media sometimes there are really great positive messages on there and i feel like those who do use it for that are so great and i love influencers i support influencers as i'm trying to be one but it is not always good for us especially if you are somebody who gets overwhelmed and anxious i don't think you should be just going to tiktok some of us need to ask for help some of us are hopeless feeling like you can't do anything some of you out there are feeling like just you don't want to do this anymore i hear you and i really hope that i i can speak to you right now and i really hope that you know that i love you i don't know who you are but i love you and your your life 
everything matters you matter so much you matter to me just because you're here if you're hearing this message like you matter to me i care about you and you deserve to be on this earth and nothing that you do or say mean takes that meaning away from you i really think it's important to ask for help even like it doesn't have to be a family member it doesn't have to be a friend i'm going to have a huge list of hotlines so if you do not feel comfortable going to a relative or a family member or a friend please do check out a hotline if you are in need if you are feeling suicidal call somebody tell somebody talk to somebody because you do not need to do this alone you do not deserve to do this alone and nothing that you have done makes you deserve to do this alone like nothing you have done makes you scum on the earth it doesn't mean that you don't matter nothing takes that meaning of life away from you all right, so I understand if you don't have money for this, but I would like to mention it. CBT and DBT therapy. DBT therapy and CBT therapy could be really good for you if you cannot afford that. I'm also going to link some resources in the description for you guys to try out. Um, not only were the there will be some like suggested apps but there will also be like articles to read and some pdfs you can print out so lots of great stuff is going to be in the description i really encourage you guys to check it out but after the video is done other things i would suggest too i'm going to put in the description some support groups and religious groups because i feel like that's important to address as somebody who um has been in the walk with spirituality and who has been learning about it and kind of has felt like I don't really fit in with a lot of people because of it. I, I think it's so great to talk to somebody in that group and try and find a community that's part of that group. So just being able to find people like you, honestly, like that's, that's really hard sometimes and I know, but this is an opportunity for you too. And if you look at it like an opportunity and not like it's just therapy that you need to do, I think that could really help you too. Managing your social, your social time. So this is, as I said, this is all like this is why you need to do like self-reflection because everybody's situation is different because some people might need more social time some people might need less social time if you are somebody who notices that you feel like you are isolating yourself if you feel kind of set apart from your group if you feel disconnected from your friends i would encourage you to reach out and try and implement more social time but if you are somebody like me who is feeling overwhelmed with that and you just feel like you have a really strict overwhelming schedule then maybe you need to take a step back from social time maybe you need to take some time yourself and isolate yourself so that's why i say like it's not it's not a black and white answer like it's it's really everybody is a different a different situation everybody is different so like really you just have to see what situation you're in what stressors you're in and how you're responding right now and maybe how you need to change your response or how you need to respond differently in the future honorable mentions um meditation is really good um healthy foods are important as i mentioned before healthy foods because cortisol and increased stress can increase appetite and increase junk food and visceral fat i've been looking into that recently i've just been learning about it so i'm not going to touch too much on it right now setting boundaries for yourself it is so important to set boundaries for yourself and this kind of goes ahead with the social time thing a little bit because if you are realizing that you're spending too much time with others and not yourself enough, that's a boundary you need to set for yourself. That's a boundary I've been needing to set for myself is to isolate myself again a little bit more and to spend quality time with myself. And I talked about this in my first video a little bit, so I encourage you to check that out. I kind of touch on how to implement these habits into your life um, and how to actually achieve your goals. So check it out. But um, yeah, just setting boundaries for yourself telling other people no when you need to but don't try and set other people's boundaries so this is something that i disagree with when i see it's it's not explained well enough that we don't set boundaries for other people we set boundaries for ourselves and like you can set boundaries in the sense of like you're not going to spend as much time with that person because you feel like it's toxic for you or it's not good for you or they just have a ne negative look on life and like you just feel like it disrupts your homeostasis or whatever like I don't know what it is so that is a boundary you're setting for yourself you don't set boundaries for other people you don't tell other people how to live their lives this is something that we all need to realize because like in a relationship 
you can set boundaries together, but you are not setting your partner's boundary. You can't tell somebody that they need to spend less time on their phone because that's not going to help them. That's telling them that they need to set a boundary for themselves that they haven't decided that they need to set for themselves. So you aren't helping them in any way because they aren't feeling the need to do that and you're just going to like it's just not going to set a good cycle it's not going to inspire them or motivate them to not be on their phone as much it's just going to set off an oh why are you judging me like what do you not spend as much time on your phone just because you don't spend as much time on your phone doesn't mean I don't have to like that's basically what happens realizing when we are putting our stress upon other people like I've said before because I totally have done this in the past and I'm I am not good about this all the time but we definitely put our stress on other people sometimes and we really need to step back and just realize oh you know what like this is a boundary that I need to set for myself I can't push it on you something else I'm really trying to establish is implementing more gratitude so there's so many studies there's so many talks about this but implementing more gratitude in your life can really really improve it and just trying to realize those little moments as I've said before so exercise yoga mindfulness practices developing schedules and routines i've already touched on that limiting media reducing caffeine basically to regulate your cortisol levels to regulate your stress levels to regulate your nervous system i don't know whatever terminology you want to use because i don't know if there's really technically a per proper terminology for it i don't know if we really can say we're regulating the nervous system but to regulate the nervous system Andrew Huberman tops, talks about the sicilic, sicilic sigh. Sorry, say that 10 times fast. The sicilic sigh. So this is basically like a two-part sigh. So Andrew Huberman says that this can really regulate your stress levels and just like help you to calm down. So it's just that two-part sigh of... <sighs> Another thing that can regulate the nervous system is to walk just going for a walk outside moving your body just getting some flow going like that's helping you to regulate your nervous system just doing some spinal waves and that kind of thing just get your flow going do some dancing get it out of your system like just regulate that nervous system <laughs> and then something else can be uh, so pupillary convergency or dilating the gaze so this kind of depends where you're at again in your situation if you can't focus one thing you can do is to stare at one thing on your screen and just focus on that for a while and then like try and focus in again i don't know how good that will work but i do feel that the dilating your gaze is great so just go and look out a window and just focus on it all don't focus on just little things because this is something I've really seen and noticed as I get stressed as I really focus on everything and I'm not even just like scanning the room. I'm not just looking at what's around me and that can really help you just regulate your nervous system and just balance it all out and everything. So that's, as I said, where you're at. If you're having troubles concentrating, sometimes it's good to focus on things. If you're having a hard time to relax and just appreciate things, like try and not focus on everything. And my camera died again, but we're gonna go ahead and keep continuing on because I don't want to wait for it to charge because it's just gonna get worse lighting. So as I was saying, there's lots of breathing exercises that I'm gonna list in the, the description below, but one of the ones that is very common I see is box breathing. Um, so box breathing is, is such a... <laughs> So box breathing is essentially inhaling for four counts, holding for four counts, and then exhaling for four counts. There's so many different variations of this. I've heard the 448 as well. There's so many different breathing exercises out there. So for my breathing exercises, I actually have been using this app called Finch. This is not sponsored, although I wish that they would sponsor me because I love it so much. It's so freaking cute. But I wanted to share it just because I feel like it can maybe help other people. Such a cute app, and you basically, like, you... Uh, you have this little penguin that you hatch you can also have little micro pets but basically like there's little goals you can set for yourself and you can go through you can buy things for your little penguin and then you can also um you can go and do focus breathing there's a nine one there's like a first aid kit for if you are in a crisis and like just there's so many great things there I think there's actually the box breathing like a navy seal on there so if you wanted to check that out on the app like you could otherwise just look it up on YouTube um as I said I'm going to put in the description like multiple different resources so yeah there's lots of different breathing 
techniques out there so it's just about finding the ones that you you can use for yourself yoga helps me relax so much genuinely you guys and it is pretty universal like a lot of people can do yoga even though you don't think you can like there's so many alternative moves in yoga for you to be able to if you're not as flexible so that is all that i have for you guys today so, without further ado